All right, I think we're we're going now. <laughs> well, uh, my, of course, like welcome to our the, the Thriving Marriage Podcast. My name is Mark Johnston. We don't have Heather today, but uh, that's fine. We're gonna have a nice conversation, a nice discussion, all on the topic of how to save your marriage without your your spouse's involvement. I know that might might seem like this daunting, daunting thing. Um, Especially if, like, your your partner is on the fence or even really checked out of the, the marriage. Uh, but I want to talk to you about some of the, the principles that we use here with High Thrive Coaching. And uh, hopefully you can walk away with a little bit of uh, some extra knowledge on, on what to do. So before we get into that, we, we always like to share a client win of the week. Uh, this time it's coming from an anonymous user from our group. They're saying, uh, thank you. I can't wait to get home so I can read it. I, I really love and appreciate High Thrive's approach. It makes so much sense to me. And my husband had a really bad story in his head about me and our and our young adult children. This is just a kind of a little bit of a conversation back and forth between this person uh, and, and one of our team members. So our team member responds, you're welcome. Really appreciate this. Uh, she says, I, I recommend you guys to everyone in this terrible situation we find ourselves in. They kind of that it's too much money for an investment, which I say divorce is even more expensive. Invest in your marriage if that's what you want. So I, uh, this woman here really been has been seeing a lot of progress in her program. Uh, she acknowledged that her husband had started to create this really negative narrative about her and going through some of our our material and getting some support from us has really turned her situation around. So I really appreciate that. Just a little insight uh, into some success there. So we did put uh, a question out for all of you to, to respond to. Uh, we were saying on a scale of one to 10, how confident do you feel about saving your marriage on your own? We had a lot of responses. We, we put these in two different groups. We have a 60 second plan to get your spouse back. We also have our regular thriving marriage group. Uh, and it sounds like a lot of people are really down in the dumps. They, they don't have a lot of confidence. I'm getting a lot of ones and zeros. Um, well, <laughs> zero wasn't even one of the, uh, <laughs> the numbers that we gave, but Sounds like you know a lot of people really don't have a lot of hope. Uh, but people who do explain it, they're like, "I wish I had some hope. I wish I understood what I could do here." Um, or they might say that, you know, "I wish I could be higher, like a ten, but his actions really make it hard." And once again, I, I believe that this. Yeah, I understand that this can be really frustrating whether that is you wanting to make things better and you're feeling frustrated and stuck, or maybe it's you want things to be better, but you don't see how they could be different, especially if your your partner is really checked out. And that's why we we wanted to have this this discussion today about what do you actually do here it, to save your marriage on your own? Is that even possible? Is that even what should be done because you know I, I do think that there there's a lot of professionals out there that would say well if your your partner isn't on board then maybe you really need to reconsider this but heather and i my uh, my business partner and i we we really want to provide a, a space for people who really want to fight for their marriage for people who don't want to give up despite everyone else saying that maybe that's the best option because we understand that your marriage is important to you and not everyone wants to give up that easily. So we provide the tools, uh, everything that can be done to, to get a marriage from that really difficult spot to something a, a lot more manageable to where the, the couple is working together. So how do how how does one go about saving their marriage without their spouse's involvement? If it's gotten to this point, we can assume a few things. And I just want to establish some things that we're on the same page. We can assume that, you know, some of these things are true, that the partner doesn't care enough 
uh, to save their relationship. And so we have this situation here where, like, you know, they just don't want to work on things. They, they don't care enough. So they're, they're going to check out. Um, or, you know, to, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to hold on. I'm, I'm just realizing I can look at the chat. I, I forgot about that I'm, as I'm focusing in on this myself. I'll tell you, just to be transparent, usually with Heather and I going back and forth, it makes it a lot easier to, to pay attention to the chat. I am paying attention today, don't worry. So if you do have some comments or questions, please put it in there. But like I said, you know, we can assume a couple things. The, the partner doesn't care enough to save their relationship. Um, perhaps your partner is so far gone and hurt. That they don't, they just don't want to participate in fixing things. Maybe they don't believe that any effort will change anything. In general, what I would say is that most people who have gotten to that point, they've lost hope. Um, hope that anything could possibly solve this impossible problem that they've found themselves in. And so what do they do? They, they back off, they check out. They've built up certain beliefs that prevent them from putting in the effort right now. Uh, hey, Angelica, I see that Angelica is here tagging some people. I had some questions. Good to have you here. And Donovan, good to have you here too. Uh, so like I said, we it gets to this point because certain beliefs have built up. It says nothing can work. So they back out. So the important question to get asked here is how do these stories get created within a relationship? I know within my own marriage, there's been different points where both positive and negative narratives or stories have played, played a part and really had an impact on my own relationship with my wife, Jennifer. Um, yeah, I can think back to times where we've struggled and we, I found myself thinking and perhaps believing things like, okay, my wife doesn't care about me. Uh, or, you know, she's just going to do her own thing. She doesn't, she doesn't worry about what, what I want. She doesn't care about what I want. And the, these sort of thoughts would circle around inside my head. Now, luckily, we didn't let those things sit and we, we took care of them. But, you know, even on the other end of things, you know, my wife, Jen, and I, we tend to be very conscious about creating a specific narrative because we know how impactful it can be. And I was actually listening to some stuff on Carl Jung the other day. For those of you who are unaware, Carl Jung is one of the students of Sigmund Freud. He had his own following. Um, he was the father of psychodynamic theories. And I find myself gravitating towards him a lot recently. There, he has a lot of wisdom that, you know, if you comb through his stuff, there's a, there's a lot to be learned from that. And I was listening to something the other day, on his thoughts on the origin of neuroses. Basically, where do problems of the mind come from? Especially like a neurosis, things like anxiety and depression. Now, Carl Jung would say that neurosis comes about as problems are avoided. The, this creates a situation where there, there's this internal process of creating a negative narrative as we experience problems and then don't address them correctly in, in health, healthy ways. Essentially, he would say these behaviors, we, we, we use certain behaviors to protect ourselves and it allows us to put these problems to the side and according to, to Jung, into our subconscious where it sits and festers and causes issues. And in my opinion, let's, let's take what Carl Jung has to say about this. And we say, isn't this exactly what happens as people develop these negative narratives within their marriage? They say, I can't deal with whatever this is right now. I, I just saw my my partner, he didn't care about me. I didn't, I'm not going to deal with this. So I'm going to put it aside. I'm going to defend myself or protect myself, maybe by stonewalling, maybe by getting upset with them. But it allows me to put that problem aside and not take care of it. And what does it do? Without it processing through, without it being confronted, we start, it festers and we build up, it, 
we don't take care of it. And so then the next time that something remotely resembles that problem, we say, okay, here, here's another bit of evidence for this. And so this is where we start to begin with some solutions. Like here with High Thrive, one of the things that I've really tried to do is to make sure that everything that I teach is really backed by solid research, by solid theory. I, I think it would be, people would be hard pressed to argue that Jung didn't have some good thoughts here, didn't really think about his works. And, you know, whereas I'm not going to claim to be on the same level as Carl Jung, like, like I said, I try to back a lot of what we teach in some solid ideas like this. So if we were to discuss things in terms of Jung's principles, it would mean that solving these marriage problems would be about confronting the problems that have been avoided. You know, if the neuroses or if we put it another way, a negative narrative or story is built up as we avoid problems, as we push it aside and we allow it to, to fester, then the solution becomes, okay, I'm confronting it a lot more directly. If we were to take a, a more of a cognitive behavior, behavioral or narrative therapy approach, it would be about examining and challenging the beliefs and the narratives that have been built up around the relationship. You know, like the, the ideas overlap quite a bit. You know, a little bit is in how you know, the execution and what we do with it, but you know, that's semantics and whatnot. With that in mind, we have I have three principles that I want to keep in mind as we help guide people towards resolving marriages on their own. These are principles that I'm really uh, basing off of some of the things that we've taught for a long time. Um, but so you might you might have heard some of this before, but you know, especially this idea of confronting the things that we are avoiding. So. If you're in this boat, this is the this is the part where we start listening. These are the solutions. So the three principles are creating a clear narrative. You hear us talk about that a lot. Um, second principle is consistency, and third is accountability. And I do think that that's a really well. They're all really important, but we'll, we'll get to all this. So let's start off that first one: creating a clear narrative. A lot of what we talk about within High Thrive Coaching, this is what we refer to as creating home messages. And so in case that needs to be explained, a home message, it's it's about making clear the significance and positive intentions behind your actions. A home message is a lot like an affirmation that we share with others and is backed by demonstration. So I call it a home message because it's this idea that I like, we come back home to over and over and over again. It's meant to be comforting. It's meant to be very clear what it's about. Like when we think of a home, we have a, a clear image in our mind about what that is. You know, most people, if they think about their home positively, they say, okay, here's this place where I can come back to. It's the safe space that really helps me to, to recharge and feel good about myself, my life and whatnot. Obviously, you know, there are some homes that <laughs> aren't providing for that, but this is what it's meant by having a home message. It's something we come back to, and it's very clear what the, the purpose of this is. So part of creating a clear narrative is about demonstrating that story that we are trying to build. It's essentially two parts. It's the actions that we take, and it's the words that we use to clearly communicate the significance behind our actions. This is a lot about like what we do to create a clear narrative. So if marriages go bad, as we view each other and the actions that are taken, and uh, we, we view each other negatively and the actions that are taken, and we start attributing negative significance to those actions, we might say things like, my husband didn't set a date, so he must not care. My wife doesn't support my hobbies, so what I want doesn't matter. We can see in these examples where the interpretation, the significance, or the meaning behind the actions is really the thing that has the impact. So it's it's that negative meaning that's created behind these actions that actually matter. So to fix it, we need to create that positive meaning that explains those positive intentions behind the things that we're doing. 
without clear action and clarity in the intentions, it's really difficult to change that narrative. So for, like I mentioned earlier, my wife and I, we really try to build up a positive narrative within our own marriage. So some of the things that we actively try to build up, we try to say, okay, that we matter to each other. This is something that's reinforced on a daily basis. You know, myself or my wife, we might stop the other person and say, hey, look, I really love you. I, I care about you. We look each other in the eyes when we say that. We might, uh, we try to reinforce this idea that there's support for each of us to be an individual. Tonight, you know, in the evening, I'm going to go be very nerdy with with some friends and we're going to play <laughs> we're going to play some board games and it's my my nerdy hobby but my wife is 100 behind it she says okay yeah it's going to be a little bit harder for me because you're going to be busy this evening but she wants to be there and i equally support her in her own pursuits like that uh another thing that we try to build up we say that our relationship is something special or unique we talk about this a lot we say hey isn't it something great that we were able to meet under such interesting circumstances we it was really a chance encounter that we were able, we met and you know isn't what we have great these are the, some some of the ideas that we we try to build up and donna is agreeing with me donna says interpretation is critical we didn't speak clearly and it caused uh, these negative feelings for me i would agree and this is why like why my wife and i why we work so much at maintaining a, a specific message because this is one of the takeaways that I've had from working in this this field for nearly a decade now is that that narrative is so important so number two consistency the second principle here consistency means a lot about correcting the situation when our actions are misinterpreted or when we demonstrate something other than our home message a moment ago, I said, you know, one of the messages that my wife and I try to build, we say we matter to each other and we support each other in our pursuits. If for some reason my wife interpreted some of my actions to mean other than that, that would be upsetting. And it would mean that, you know, my job there would be to help correct that situation to demonstrate, you know, to reinforce that, that message that we're trying to build. It's really hard to create a new narrative if your message is mixed and inconsistent. And I see that, uh, this problem a lot. Now, I, I understand that part of the issue here may not be all of you listening to this. Part of it is all those little times that your partner says, ah, see, here's, here's the reason why I need to pull away. And then they don't say anything to you. And you don't know that your actions were taken negatively. And so it it is important to, you know, like in, in my opinion, if everything is, uh, if you're trying to fix the situation, it can be very helpful to have very open, open communication at this stage. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to be perfect in terms of consistency, it, but it does mean that you take effort to correct things when situations don't support the new narrative that you're trying to build. I, I, I'm going to keep going back to the example of my own marriage. I think it's the easiest one for me to talk about. But, you know, certainly um, I've, I've seen many instances where either my wife or I view some of our interactions and we say, what just happened there? Why, why was my wife not listening to me? Or my wife might say, why was Mark not trying to support me here? And always when we when the other person hears of like that that interpretation one of the things that we've really fostered within our marriage is we, that we take time to to really talk about talk that through and make sure that things are good and i i am firmly of the belief that a lot of relationships that that go bad somewhere in there that that wasn't happening that repair didn't happen and we could go back to jung remember all, a lot of these problems come about as we try to push these problems aside and we don't address them and we kind of shove them down into the subconscious that, so we don't have to deal with it anymore. If you're going to be consistent, 
you can't have it pushed aside. Thirdly, we have accountability. Now, if you've been clear with communicating your new narrative, and if you've been consistently de demonstrating your home message, then you're already holding yourself accountable for your, the changes that needed to happen. Fixing your marriage on your own does, though, eventually require you to hold your partner accountable for their mindset, their narrative, their actions. But Mark, a lot of my clients say to me, they say, my partner won't accept being held accountable. They'll say, well, I don't want to do that, or I don't need to do that, or you can't tell me what to do, or any number of, of things. Uh, Don, you know, I'll come back to that in a second. Donovan's asking some questions here. Donovan says, what do you do if they have decided for you what your actions have to be in order for them to feel like you are respecting their decisions? Like completely walking away from it all and only accepting their decision for you. It's a really good question, Donovan. And this is, this is, I, I wanted to read that specifically because it does apply to our, this accountability piece. I actually had this question somewhat asked of me earlier. Uh, earlier in the day, I was in a, a group call with some clients and there was someone that, came and asked me like well, okay well what can I do here if to find some common ground to find some sort of compromise of what we want is different things um, much like what Donovan is asking you know this is a scenario where the the solution was already prescribed it says this is what has to happen in order for there to be some understanding or for there to be a win here and why I'm relating this to accountability is it's really important to, to have a clear understanding of what is wanted and to really get underneath of it all. If, you know, the, the ultimate goal is to be able to support each other or to have respect or to, yeah, like in Donovan's case, have someone's decisions be respected. Okay, great. Are the two of you together in that goal? If we're applying this to accountability, then that means part of this is going both ways. You know, are you, all of you listening to me, are you taking the actions necessary to demonstrate respect or demonstrate care or demonstrate affection or whatever it happens to be that is needed? But then similarly, if you're showing up and you're doing what you need to do to provide for that in your relationship, it allows you to ask the same from your partner. Um, you know, this doesn't completely answer Donovan's question. Uh, I, if I take a brief 20 seconds to, to answer that, you know, generally what I prescribe in those situations, Donovan, is I say to, to boil down the solution that's being prescribed here into its into basic needs in terms of what is wanted is this person who's saying okay it needs to be this way what are they asking for are they asking to feel more secure are they asking to feel more connected are they asking to feel more respected okay when we get down to the those base roots it becomes easier to say, okay, if you're, you're looking for respect, what are some many ways that we can demonstrate respect? How can we support this? Like I said, we, we, we apply this to accountability as we have this go both ways. And for you to save your marriage on your own, you do need to eventually hold some accountability for your, your partner. If they are continually interpreting things negatively, and yet you've been clearly communicating your positive intentions and then demonstrating those act, uh, like demonstrating that that's the truth you can then start challenging that you can say is this really disrespect when i've actually asked for your opinion and i've followed through over here and trying to help you with what you want if you can confidently say that you've demonstrated the changes that need to happen for things to be healthy on your end it is just so 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 much easier for you to turn around and, and say, hey, if there's still problems here, perhaps we need to support some change on your end. 
Perhaps we need to figure out why you're looking at this negatively. Perhaps we need to see what it is that you actually want and have you talk here a little bit. And you can notice like a lot of like my accountability here is not accusatory or judgmental or blaming or anything. Uh, yeah, so this, this moment where we start to develop more accountability shouldn't come from a place of judgment, like I said, but it also doesn't allow for there to be any more avoidance for what needs to, to happen. And this is a really tr very tricky stage that needs to be handled with care, which is why we, we're always looking to figure out ways to help our clients refine the communication that's happening around these actions. So that's what I have to say in the matter is those three principles. And I will get to Donovan done with asking some more questions here in the chat in a, in a moment. But like, I, I understand that this isn't everything, but this is a, a large basis of where we try to create a lot, of, a lot of our solutions here with our coaching. It's not the entirety of the program, obviously, but you know, that clear narrative, that consistent action, that accountability for yourself and your partner is a, you know, a good solid foundation for creating that repair that's really needed in a lot of relationships. So before we get onto the marriage myth buster, I'm going to address Donovan's question. He's saying that his wife is asking to be gone and out of his, uh, her life to, to walk away from property and leave town. And he says it's not something that he's willing to do. Uh, and it's consistently said that wants to compromise and to address her disagreements with the mediator. So Donovan, it sounds like this is a complicated uh, issue. Uh, there could be any number of things that needs to happen here. Uh, but, you know, I'm wondering here how well you've kind of established your case, how well you've created that that narrative, how well you've really built up trust that things are healthy on your end, that the changes that need to happen on your end are happening. And that I know that's that's a difficult thing when she's saying, okay, the, the changes I'm looking for is respect, and respect means you, you lead, and that's that's a complicated issue. It's a complicated case. So I it's hard for me to address all these sort of things in this format. So we do occasionally have question and answer periods. Uh, if you're looking for for that, if you're looking for that kind of support, please let us know in the comments and we, we like to set those up on occasion. Or if you're really needing some more direct support, of course, we always are willing to do an assessment call to see if our program is something that would fit your your circumstances, whether we could help you. So on to our we our marriage myth buster. We every week we always look for comments and the, our social media pages. Uh, we listen to our own clients. We listen to the things that all of you say. And we we like to to clarify some thinking here and there. I'm not saying hey, like all of you are. I'm I'm not trying to say oh, you guys are all <laughs> not thinking well on these things. But I think it is good to make sure that we're all we we break down some of these myths that don't don't create health for our relationships. And so this week's myth is this idea that the lack of love is one of the main reasons that marriages break down, one of the main reasons for problems. Now, I, I want to say that this myth is both has some truth to it, but also at the same time does not. Now, I want to explain myself. I myself uh, am very particular about language. Words should mean what they mean, because when the wrong words are used, we start to create confusion in what we are describing. Uh, I, I see this come up, especially with certain mental health terms. We hear words thrown around, like abuse and narcissism, um, bipolar, things like that. And for many cases, that that's an accurate description, but not all. And so I, I think the um, when we use the wrong word, it it creates a little bit of confusion in what we're actually trying to say. Uh, I think the, the problem with this myth, in my opinion, is the, is the word, use of the word love. You know, love. Largely, it's a problem because love can 
mean so many different things to different people. Love might mean those fluttery, excited feelings you get when you think about and are anticipating those positive moments with your partner. Or love might mean taking care of someone who needs your support. Or it might mean spending quality time focusing on the person that you love. It also might mean you and your partner in a positive light in most every circumstance. The problem with the statement, like a lack of love is the main reason for, for problems in a marriage, is that it doesn't accurately describe what has happened in almost every single case, in my opinion. So why does this matter? Because if this statement is to be believed, then it means that all you need to do is to create more love in order to fix things. But what does that even mean? It leaves people confused. How do you, like, it's just, it's too re reductionistic. So while, while I would agree that in some cases there is a lack of love, as in a certain kind of emotion or a, a desire to connect on a deep level, I generally want to be more specific with what that actually means when I'm helping someone come up with solutions to the problem. It's only then can we actually remedy whatever's going on. So I hope that that makes sense there, that like my problem isn't that this statement, the lack of love as a is a main cause for problems. It's not that it's inaccurate. It's just that it doesn't accurately describe so many scenarios and there's oftentimes a lot of other things that need to be explained and need to be brought out need to be understood in order to actually get to a real solution so uh next week we're going to be sharing with you uh, a little bit of a discussion about whether there's hope for you if your spouse is having an affair and like what to do in those scenarios so if you are interested in that topic, let us know. Uh, if you would like a little bit more support, let us know. We are always looking for how we can best serve our community. So please let us know how we can help all of you. Uh, with that, thank you all for listening. And uh, I'll we'll see you all next week. All right, bye. Thanks for listening to The Thriving Marriage, your A to Z blueprint for not just surviving marriage, but thriving. Until next time, my friends, thrive on.